Good evening, everybody. Welcome to School Psych Podcast. Happy to be back again. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Maryland. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca now, who's going to tell you a little bit about how to participate tonight. Rebecca? Hi, everybody. I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. And uh, the easiest way to participate tonight, if you're watching us live, is to log into your YouTube um, account or your Google uh, account and comment right alongside of the screen um, in the chat box. And I'll be looking, we'll be looking at comments and questions there, but also on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. I'll look for notifications. And on either of the Facebook pages, School Psyched, Your School Psychologist, or the School Psyched Podcast page, you can message me or you can write a comment right at the last post on the page and I'll be looking out for you. We're really excited for this conversation and we'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences and questions. And now here's Eric. Hi everybody, I'm Eric and I'm a school psychologist also in Connecticut. And we are excited to have Dave Kilpatrick with us tonight. And uh, Dave is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at uh, College at Cortland. And he teaches courses there in learning disabilities and educational psychology. He's also a New York State certified school psychologist and has done over a thousand evaluations of students with reading difficulties during his 27 years with the East Syracuse Manoa Central School District. Uh, Dave currently conducts research on reading difficulties and does professional development workshops for educators. He's also the author of Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties through uh, published through Wiley & Sons. So Dave, welcome to School Psych Podcast. We're excited to have you here. And um, as school psychs, uh, most of us are, the majority of our evaluations, I think, are in reading difficulties. So um, I don't know if uh, that can lead us into maybe what some of your experience with um, assessing reading difficulties uh, maybe in terms of word level reading or comprehension, what kinds of things have you come across uh, most typically, I guess? Well, um, new insights tend to come slow to me. And so uh, it was probably about 15 years into my practice as a school psychologist. I came home one day and said to my wife, you know, like 90% of what I do has to do with either reading problems or ADHD at some level or another, you know? And um, so those are things I decided to, you know, had been putting a lot of my time and energy in reading. Um, starting in, so I, I actually was a school psychologist for 28 years, and uh, I've been teaching courses in learning disabilities for uh, 24 years. Those overlap. I'm not 78, uh, just so you know. <laughs> and, um, you look good for 78. <laughs> so, so for 11 years, I was uh, teaching courses, and like, you know, after my day at the school district, I jump in the car, drive down, and do a late afternoon class in learning disabilities or ed psych or whatever. And so I had access to the research. And, and the thing is that my first nine years as a school psychologist, I really didn't know a whole lot about reading research. I had the fortunate opportunity, a guy by the name of Phil McGinnis. He used to be the president of the New York Association of School Psychologists way back in the days when NASP was just forming, actually. And um, I, went, I attended a workshop he did in the summer of 97. And that's when I first got introduced to this huge huge uh, enterprise of reading research that cuts across lots of disciplines. It's tens of millions of tax dollars are spent on that every year. It goes into journals and the only people that see it are other reading researchers. And so as a practicing school psychologist, I was like, whoa, you know, I need to know about this. Um, so my, for my first nine years, I feel like I, I gave some not so great advice after my evaluations. And, um, and my first two or three years, maybe three years working doing courses in learning disabilities. I mean, I look back now and I go, wow, I wish I could contact some of those students, tell them, hey, I got some better stuff for you now, you know, <laughs> maybe. So anyway, uh, really the, the Wiley book was all about trying to introduce the school psychology field to this very large uh, enterprise. The only things that we tend to hear from that are, you know, everybody's heard of the reading panel. And that was really trying to summarize some of the research up until that point, it's getting a little bit dated. It's not dated in the sense that the basic concepts have changed. Uh, we've refined quite a bit and we've learned a lot more. And, and some of that lot more is actually very useful and practical. Awesome, I definitely would like to hear a little bit about, yeah, the, the updates to that because I still reference, you know, the work of, of the reading panel and whatnot, but I was just thinking the other day that, yeah, it's, it's been kind of a while since 
that came out. Can you speak a little bit to wh what has changed or at least what, what, what are we focusing on now? No, I don't think anything has changed. I think we have a better understanding of things. Um, my focus has been on word level reading, not so much comprehension. I've, I've read dozens and dozens and dozens of articles on comprehension, but I've read hundreds and hundreds on word reading. Um, and so that's where my focus is. The first three sections of the, of, uh, the panel report, which was uh, phonemic awareness and phonics and fluency. So a couple updates related to that, you might say. Uh, when it comes to fluency, uh, if you read the full volume, most people seem like they're familiar with the, the little 30-page summary. Um, but if you're a geeky person like me and you read the 400-page version multiple times, um, then, you know, one of the things you're going to notice is they really acknowledge that there wasn't a lot on, uh, on fluency at the time. Uh, and, and yet it's part of our big five. You know, and so we treat the big five like Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. You know, you don't mess with the Ten Commandments. You don't mess with the big five. The problem is we had a, a big jump in understanding of the nature of fluency after the reading panel in the early 2000s. So what we now understand is that fluency is primarily a byproduct of the size of a, of a child's uh, sight vocabulary or another term we use for it is orthographic lexicon. In other words, we have this pool of words, like when we adults read, we rarely have to sound out a word, unless it's some new technical term, or or if you're reading the news, it's uh, some name you've not come across before and you're not familiar with. And for the most part, we're reading out of a data bank that ranges from about 30 to 70,000 words that just jump out at us instantaneously the minute we see it. That's our sight vocabulary. doesn't matter if the words are high frequency, low frequency, if they are... Um, uh, phonically regular or irregular, they're familiar words. So individuals who have a large orthographic lexicon or site vocabulary move through text very quickly and automatically because they're not putting effort into words. They can focus on the comprehension. And that's a lot of where the uh, extra uh, prosody comes from. So if you're understanding as you go along, you can add prosody in proper, uh, at proper points. Um, and those that have limited site vocabularies, they go plowing through text, that, you know, there are a lot of words they don't know, they've got to try to sound them out, usually they're not even good at sounding out words, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, that's a big shift um, in terms of, you know, fluency isn't just about getting kids to read stuff over and over again. It's not like the words are in there, they're just not getting them out fast enough. Uh, and I, I'd be happy to elaborate more on that. The other major area is with phonemic awareness. Um, there really has been um, a lot on that but what hasn't happened is that we haven't integrated multiple uh, research literature. So we have in this vast reading research multiple niche areas because there's about six, seven, eight hundred research articles appear in reading every year in English. And nobody can stay on top of all of it. And so people have to specialize. And so what I've been trying to do is uh, combine some of the niche areas that aren't talking to each other, not because they have different philosophies, just because you can't keep up on everybody else's literature. It'd be like a cardiologist trying to keep up on ophthalmology and an ophthalmologist trying to keep up on, you know, uh, some other area. So, um, so anyway, I've never been a specialist. I worked as a school psychologist. I wonder about that kid sitting across the table. So I pulled from the orthographic learning literature, the, pho the phonological awareness literature, the intervention literature, uh, the dyslexia literature. And, and I've tr been trying to integrate those four literatures. And we now have a much better understanding of exactly where phonemic awareness fits in and why it's so important for reading. Where in the past, quite frankly, it was a matter of, yeah, it's important, so we should do something with it, but I'm not exactly sure why. What surprises me with phonemic awareness is how little teachers know about it or even realize what it is. A lot of times I, I bring that up as, you know, have we, have we looked at phonemic awareness? Is that intact, you know, before we're um, kind of moving on? And a lot of times they're kind of like, oh, well, they think it's phonics. They think I'm talking about phonics and they don't understand that it's a, a different thing. <laughs> um, I don't know if you see yeah. that well, the teachers, are they, are they being educated in that, in their graduate programs, you know? <laughs> Not really. Um, if they are, it's just, in, it's just in passing because they know that there's a little pressure to do that. Um, in many, well, here's what's interesting. I, I've talked with people from many different 
areas within academia. I've been in academia for a long time. You talk to someone in early education, they're going to say, well, we, we do a lot with all kinds of stuff with early education, but we're not like specialists in, in reading problems and things like that, you know. Okay, so you go to the special ed folks and the special ed folks, well, we do lots of stuff related to special ed, you know, special ed, but we're not, we're not experts like on reading and dyslexia and things like that. Oh, okay, so you go to the literacy folks and they say, we do all kinds of stuff related to literacy, but we're not like experts when it comes to reading disorders per se, right? So it's like the old three shell game, but there's not a pebble under any shell. Mm. But the reality, the reality is that every one of those disciplines, including many more, many disciplines within psychology and medicine and linguistics and speech pathology, have a, a very tiny percentage of individuals who are contributing to this reading research. It is multidisciplinary. It cuts across a lot of areas. And I do have to say um, that uh, school psychology is very underrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, in the Society for Scientific Study of Reading, I would be surprised if we have more than three or four school psychologists out of our membership of like 500. Um, so I'd like to get more people involved and know more about it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only voice. I don't want to be the only voice. Um, I, I have a kind of a follow-up to that Essentials book that should be out in, in the next few months. Uh, it's just finished, just got the last uh, editing on the very last book chapter. But basically, it's an edited volume. Each chapter is contributed by a person who's at the top of their niche area within the reading research. And, and it's the, the target audience is school psychologists. Wow. Yeah. What's that going to be called? We haven't decided yet. Okay. <laughs> I have to I have to look it up, but it's uh, well, if you give me a second, if you don't mind, if I look sure. away here, uh, I, I can tell you exactly because I have that file open. Uh, the other two editors and I were deciding, and there we go. Uh, this is off the record. You're not recording this, are you? No, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, let's just say the working title is something to the effect of. I've got it's got to be a long name with a subtitle of course <laughs> uh the science of reading development and reading problems bridging the gap between research and practice so that's good that's great. that is good i was going to suggest a poll for our audience so if you are if you're not sure let us know <laughs> send you the list that we editors were you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm calling with two other people so we would love that it would be such an honor to have a psych podcast viewer name your book <laughs> But I have a question related to fluency, and then we have a great viewer question as well. So I thought they're both related to fluency, so I thought I'd ask them both, and um, you could tell me if it makes sense to kind of uh, lead one into the other. I was thinking when you were, when you first opened, and you said most of your referrals um, as a school psychologist were either reading or ADHD, I was wondering how um, visual memory or visual memory weakness in particular affects fluency and if it is a student with ADHD you know how do you address that and then our viewer question was if a student has low fluency but has great comprehension should we really continue to focus so much on fluency especially when it is one of the specific areas that students can qualify for a specific learning disability well because of the limits of my working memory I don't I don't know anything you just said <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Okay. So the that is a long question though. Um, so, yes. In the, yeah, in the first part, the visual memory plays almost no role in word level reading. Um, that is a, a common. That, that's a very strong intuitive thought. But we have many different lines of inquiry that are unrelated to each other that all converge on the fact that it, it really isn't. Um, you know, consider the fact that the average reading level of a student who graduates high school who's deaf reads at about a third grade level. You know, how how could we account for that if, um, you know, because they have just as good of visual skills. We've known since the 1970s that the correlation between visual memory skills and reading is not zero, but it's functionally near zero. So you have kids that are very good word readers that have very poor visual memory skills. And you have, uh, you know, kids with really great mem memory skills who are poor readers, so visual memory. Um, it's orthographic memory. So, for example, if a child learns the word B-E-A-R, which is obviously a common character in children's stories, mm -hmm. and they encounter for the first time the uppercase version of that, they will instantaneously, if they know the lowercase version instantly, 
they will instantly respond to the word in its uppercase. Now you got to think about it. Look at each of those letters. None of those letters in uppercase looks like the lowercase version. It's not like big C, little C, big O, little O. They're different. And yet the child has never seen that visual display before, yet has instantaneous recognition. Why? Because that's orthographic memory. Orthographic memory is a familiarity with the uh, actual letter order of a word. And um, that's how we that's how we read. We uh, doesn't matter what the font is, the typeface, uppercase, lowercase, none of that matters. That's all those are the visual features as long as uh, the letters are legible. And when you think about it, it's based on a principle that underlies all of our memory system. Categorization. You walk into an unfamiliar room you've never been in before. You're not like, whoa, what's this? Is this a cave, a room? What is it? You know, No, you immediately recognize it's a room in a house, a room in a building or whatever. You don't look at a chair you've never seen before and are puzzled and scratching your head. So we are constantly categorizing the things around us in our environment at lightning fast. That's We couldn't function if we could, as we're seeing new things. Well, in the same way, uh, we have an abstract representation of all the letters of the alphabet. And it doesn't matter what version of A it is. As long as I know that that represents A, uh, I'm good to go. So the, the visual part basically goes from the page to your occipital lobes. And there, there's very little visual, you know, true visual memory that is involved after that. Uh, then what happens, the, the signal kind of lands down at the base of our, our temporal occipital area. That's the left fusiform gyrus. And, and you know when you talk about neuropsych, you, you, by nature you have to oversimplify. But roughly speaking, that's kind of our data bank of familiar letter sequences. Um, so uh, it's, the, it's the sequence of letters that are familiar, not the visual look of the word. So that's the, that was the first part. Now, I did, I did because of the working memory phenomenon, I forgot the second part, which was the, the question <laughs> from the viewer. Which was, if the child has low fluency but great comprehension, should we continue to focus on fluency? especially because they could qualify for um, SLD. Fluency is one of the best thermometers for reading skills, by the way. Okay. There are many reasons why you might not be fluent. Uh, so, but if you're not fluent, that's telling you something's not quite right with the process. I would say that for such a child, uh, well, first of all, it depends on when you say we're going to do stuff related to fluency. What do you mean by that? So one of the things we do, uh, is we recommend things like repeated readings and or just lots of reading practice. You have to think about the assumptions that are built into that. One possible assumption is that if you see it enough times, you'll remember it. That's the visual memory thing. I didn't even get into all the other reasons we know visual memory is not how we read. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they would include things I told you about that no correlation with um, visual memory tasks. Uh, different areas of the brain uh, systems activate during uh, strictly visual memory tasks versus, uh, you know, word reading tasks, etc. So what are we assuming? Are we assuming that if you see it enough times, you get it? That's a, not a good assumption because children that are on target for learning to read by the end of second grade, they only need to encounter a new unfamiliar word one to four times and they have it and they have it. We don't, those aren't the kids coming through our door for testing, right? The kids that are coming through our door for testing, they see the same word many, many times. They're not getting it. And it's not because of the visual memory failure. So think of the assumption going into reading, reading practice with kids that are struggling readers and repeated readings. That's, that's one possible assumption. Another possible assumption is that the word is in there. We're just not getting it out fast enough. So it's a, and what we're in a sense doing is we're transferring maybe a concept of motor fluency to reading fluency and they're not they're not the same. I mean, you look at a rapid automatized naming task do not correlate very strongly with say the motor fluency task and say the Wechsler, okay? So they're different types of speed, uh, you know. But so let's, uh, getting back to that, why is the child not fluent? Well, the best data that we now have available is that the child does not have a large sight vocabulary so some mental effort is going into the process of reading those words. And any mental effort that's taking up working memory space for that is compromising what uh, you have available for comprehension. So I guess to put it one way, if you want children to be fluent, you uh, want them to be good at remembering the words they read. Because reading practice is really the only way to become a better reader if you remember the words you read. But if you're a weak reader, you're not good at remembering the words you read. So it's almost like uh, this is a kind of an artificial divide here because reading falls on a continuum, very fine grain. If you're good at remembering the words you read, 
you have to read more to encounter more words to add more words to your science vocabulary. If you are not good at remembering the words you read, it's to use a rather crude analogy, it's like words are going in one ear and out the other. So uh, you can see it so many times, it's just not catching. So the issue is how do I make someone a fluent reader? Get them to become good at remembering the words you read. How does that work? Through a process called orthographic mapping. Orthographic mapping is the process we use to store words. And you need to know the skills that go involved in that. And the two skills that are needed are letter sound proficiency, not letter sound knowledge, that's not enough, and phonemic proficiency, not phonemic awareness, that's not enough. Letter sound knowledge and letter sound proficiency involve accuracy. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Letter sound knowledge and phonological awareness involve accuracy, where proficiency involves automaticity. And that those are the skills that underlie remembering the words we read. It's, it's not intuitive, believe me. It is not intuitive, but we got a lot of a lot of data supporting that. I think my answers are too long. Sorry. No, they're great. No, they were good. <laughs> and you know, I think I I don't remember. I haven't worked in New York State in a long time, but um, at the time we used a discrepancy model um, to identify specific learning disabilities uh, back in the early '90s. Um, you know, your your information really speaks strongly to doing good response to intervention sort of work. Um, and I'm just wondering how uh, our curriculas are, are influenced by this, or maybe they haven't caught up to this research yet. Um, not sure. <laughs> no, 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 it is not. It's not even not even close. It's there's such a huge gap between and and for example, the Journal of Learning Disabilities. That's the number one journal in special education. When I say number one, I mean they have journal rankings based upon when other journals cite them. So it's the most cited journal in special education. It has been for years. And they, in 2009, they did an entire special issue on why do we have all this great research and nobody knows about it? So yeah, there's a huge gap. It's been commented on, it's well known. Uh, I, I'm a member of the Society for Scientific Study of Reading and that represents about 500 or so researchers from around the world. And uh, there's always at least one moaning Horton Hears a Who session, you know, like nobody knows about us. Nobody's paying attention to this. And yet it represents millions and millions of our tax dollars, tens of millions of our tax dollars every year. Now it's between 13 and $15 billion goes into remediation in our country for teachers, general ed, special ed. But when it comes to this, so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actual reading research. Um, and so, but it, as I said, it goes into journals and the only people that know about it are, um, other researchers, and that's really unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a better understanding of this as school psychologists would help us assess more accurately when students actually have reading, true reading difficulty, um, perhaps a neuro, neurobiological problem as opposed to a skill deficit. Um, but maybe, uh, I guess one question I would ask is, um, what would be typical go-tos for you in terms of assessment? Obviously you have a, a much broader knowledge base than the typical school psychologist. Um, but those of us using the, you know, the WJ, the WISC, the GORT, those kinds of things, what might be some strategies that you would come yeah. up with? For? Well, there are two tests that I would strongly recommend, you may already be using them, a lot of people are, and I'm, I'm so delighted when I hear that a lot of people are. Uh, in a sense, they're a product of all of this research I've been talking about. They're, they're kind of the NICHD, National Institute of Child Health and Development, it's sort of like their gift to the school psychology field. And that's the CTOP, Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, and the Test of Word Reading Efficiency. The reason I say that is those were large, what, what went into that and the development of that were large NICHD funded studies. So this wasn't just a hack where someone sat down and said, hey, let me throw together a test. No, I mean, throughout the 90s, before it was released in 1999, the first version, uh, there were multiple uh, research reports with large groups of kids. This is before it was even normed um, that went into that. And what you have between those two, and, and in a sense, they're like one extended battery because they're the same kids. They were norming the same kids, the, the test of word reading efficiency and the CTOP. So, um, the test of word reading efficiency gives you information about the size of the child's sight vocabulary, meaning you do a timed test. You get 45 seconds to read those words. And if you have a large sight vocabulary, you're, you're going to read a lot of those. If you have a very limited sight vocabulary, you're going to get a lower score. You slow down to sound out words, the clock's ticking, you don't do so well. Uh, they also have time nonsense word reading as the second subtest. 
And each of those two subtests are 45 seconds. So I don't ever, I don't want to hear school psychologists like, I don't have the time. You know, so, come on, it's like one of the shortest tests you can give. And, uh, so anyway, um, that gives you great information. It's superior to like, say, the nonsense word on the uh, type time task on our universal batteries because the words get more complex as you go along. I think a lot of the ones I've seen on the other batteries, they're, they're about the same level of difficulty. So if you can do a CVC word or not do a CVC word, you're, you're, you know, you're good to go or not good to go. So, um, so the other thing is the CTOP gives you uh, information on four aspects of phonological processing. Phonological analysis, that's pulling apart a word or a syllable. Phonological um, uh, blending that, or, or phonological synthesis, which is blending together sounds. Unfortunately, they're grouped together on the same composite, and that is a problem because you have many children that might pull a 13 on blending and a 7 on, on you know, elision and a 9 on the isolation task, and their overall score is going to come out looking okay, and you go, huh, eh, no phonological awareness problem. No, that's, that's crying for, a, for an issue, okay? If you're in the 16th percentile on a phonological task, you know, keep in mind, based on the NAEP, NAEP, 31% of fourth graders are reading below a basic level. So, so anyway, the um, I'm not talking about diagnosing a learning disability here. I'm talking about does this kid need help? There's a big difference. Um, so, um, so with the CTOP, and then you've got uh, working memory tasks, and you have rapid automatized naming. So those represent between those two, you get all five of the five major features of what's called the phonological core deficit, which is phonological analysis, uh, phonological blending, rapid automatized naming, working memory, and uh, your letter sound, nonsense word reading skills. Mm -hmm. um, Curriculum-based assessment, does that fit? Do you use that ever? We had Dr. Burns on, for example, and he was a big proponent of using CBA to kind of pick apart reading difficulties and then remediate those difficulties. Do you use? Yeah, no, I, I haven't only because I just, it wasn't something that was easily available to me in the school district. Uh, I would think that, um, you know, uh, curriculum-based assessment has a, a lot of value, but one of the problems is that most folks, um, coming from that perspective, they, they're not necessarily up on the reading research per se. So to me, I think curriculum-based assessment is a great idea. How are you using it and what tests are you using? So, uh, you know, timed nonsense word reading um, is one of the best assessments of reading skill because it's getting at, do you have letter sound proficiency, not letter sound knowledge? You have a child at the end of first grade, and if you've done anything with, you know, I've had not only the opportunity to work with a lot of kids uh, based on, uh, you know, reading difficulties, but I have worked with hundreds of children, typical readers in studies that I've done. So by the end of first grade, and this has been documented, uh, children are going to see a CVC nonsense word like MIP and they're going to say MIP instantly. As if you just saw showed them the word sap or something or, or hit or something. Um, well, think about what that child had to do. That child had to retrieve the sound for the M, the sound for the I, the sound for the P, blend it together in one second. That's exactly that child has letter sound proficiency. They did not put any mental energy in retrieving the sound for either of those, any of those letters or blending. It all happened very quickly, okay? But another child at the end of first grade sees MIP and says, mm, eh, MIP. That kid's four, five, six months behind. That's a beginning first grade level skill. And that second child has... Letter sound knowledge. Letter sound knowledge is not enough to be a good reader. Um, so I think uh, uh, curriculum-based assessment that looks at nonsense word reading and people get down on nonsense words. You know, uh, a lot of people in the literacy field. Well, that's not authentic. It's like, well, yeah, it is because every word a child doesn't know, every real word a child doesn't know, is a nonsense word until they sound it out. Uh, not only that, every you know, all most multisyllabic words are made up of little nonsense syllables. So, um, you know, yeah, it, th there's a lot of relevance. But what it's doing is it's letting us know, is the letter sound knowledge and the blending automatic? And if it's not, the child needs some work because that's what typical readers do. So uh, same thing with wordless, you know, reading words, if it's curriculum-based assessments, having them doing uh, words timed. Timed, uh, uh, you know, curriculum-based assessment uses uh, like one minute or two minute paragraph fluency type stuff, you know, that is the best thermometer you can get because, uh, as I said, looking at fluency is so important. Um, so, you know, 
I, I, I did have the opportunity to use that in practice, but I, I support it. We have a viewer question. Um, I'm glad to hear we have a viewer. We, there are a few. <laughs> Tell me with an eye. Yeah, okay. <laughs> number of them. Uh, how is the test of word reading efficiency different than the word reading fluency or letter word identification that we frequently use? Uh, they're just looking for justification um, for their district to purchase the test. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, okay, back up a little bit. How is it different than like just a traditional word identification test? Yeah, I'm think I'm, I assumed immediately when I read that um, perhaps the WJ. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let me let me tell you about a few of those. I, see, I don't. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here. Okay, with some things, but our word identification subtests on our major batteries. Uh, you know, let let me just name five that I've had familiarity with. I've used all five of these: the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, um, the Woodcock Johnson, the Kaufman, the Wexler, and the the Rat. Okay. All of them are un, have untimed um, word identification or, or word recognition. And it's kind of interesting that some tests call it word recognition, some word identification, yet it's the same task. Mm -hmm. I like to reserve the word recognition for uh, words you already know, identification for words you're trying to figure out. Anyway, all those classic tasks are naturally confounded. There are three different reading-related skills that are going into that, and you can't separate them out on that task. So let me give you this uh, way of looking at it. You have a child with an 89 verbal IQ, okay? And then you have another child with 113. Let's say they're both fourth, gra uh, they're both fourth grade boys. The, let's say they know the exact same items on the word identification from the Woodcock Johnson. They just happen to already know those as familiar words. And they also, when you go on and give the word attack, they go on to get an, each get an 81. So they both have weak, not not non-existent, they're able to do some sounding out with those easier items, but they're compared to their peers and other fourth graders, they're pretty weak in their phonologic or their phonic decoding. So they basically have the same underlying skills. And here's what happens. One thing that differs in their vocabulary is what researchers call set for variability. Very important for we school psychologists to be aware of it. Dumb name, but very important concept. And it's an, and every school psychologist has experienced set for variability. That's when a kid starts sounding out a word doing a real hack job, not even close, and then the word pops out. You're like, whoa, where'd that come from, right? They self-correct, and you're like, that wasn't even close to what they sounded out, right? So uh, set for variability is the ability to properly identify a mispronounced word, basically. So here's what happens. That child who has the higher verbal skills, that's correlated with better set for variability. The kid with lower verbal skills has lesser set for vari variability, and that makes sense. Uh, you know, the more you know, the more words you have to draw from that you can figure this out. So now you have that kid with the 89 IQ. He starts doing the word identification test. Identify, or excuse me, recognizes the words he knew ahead of time. And with his very poor phonic decoding and his very weak set for variability, he goes on and identifies two other words on the spot. And he gets an 83 standard score. The other child with a 113 verbal IQ he, I, he recognizes the same words the first child did, and then with his equally weak uh, phonic decoding skill, but his superior set for variability, he goes on and gets 11 more items on the spot, and he gets a 93. And so the first child, we say, hey, he might even, depending on your school district and your criterion, he may even be low enough for a, a diagnosis of a, a specific learning disability in basic reading. The other child, he's average. And then we just wonder about that whiny mom who comes in and talks about, you know, the hours of homework this kid is putting in, it's because this is very effortful for this child. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is a, this is an interesting phenomenon. I call them compensators. It's the opposite phenomenon of the IQ achievement discrepancy problem. The IQ achievement discrepancy problem favor those with higher IQs. But what this compensator phenomenon is that when we assess, we actually um, put them at a disadvantage because they're able to create the impression that they're better readers than they are. That's why I get back to the fluency. That child um, would have done, uh, you know, much worse on a fluency-based uh, list reading task, like the test of word reading efficiency, or a paragraph reading task, because he does not know that many words and he was just figuring them out on the spot. So basically, our, our word identification tests confound the words you know with the words you can sound out with the words you can sound out plus uh, have the, the aid of the set for variability. 
a little bit of good news. I probably shouldn't say too much, but um, let me just say that one of the major batteries is under revision and they're going to do away with that problem. That's just good news coming up, but it's going to be like 2020. And don't ask me why I know. <laughs> we will. It's not, it's, uh, there's no commercial interest here. There can, I, there's nothing, no, no financial stuff to disclose. All I can just say, I, I just got a little bit of inside information. So, so that, that problem that I just described is going to be gone as, with, one, with one of the major upcoming batteries. Yeah. I okay. feel like we're in the know now. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I didn't say anything. I didn't say one. I didn't. Say, I just said 2020, and we're going to make that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a great uh, question from Twitter. Um, she asks, "Curious about Dave's thoughts on dyslexia as an independent disorder. It's not in the DSM-5, separate from SLD, but many groups and parents want this to be spe a specific diagnosis." Um, and and these parents think it needs to be treated in a specific way or even uh, based on a type of dyslexia, like deep surface. What are your thoughts on that? Well, basically, that's, that's kind of like a policy question, and I don't pretend to have any great answers for that. The, the reality is that reading, word-level reading skills fall along a very fine-grained continuum. And all of the skills that underlie word-level reading each fall along a fine-grained continuum. And depending on where you fall in that continuum, uh, you know, you may or may not be considered to have dyslexia. So one of the things, researchers have a really good understanding of dyslexia. Uh, the operational definition for dyslexia in all studies is simply poor word level reading. And different studies have a different cutoff. So one study will define dyslexia as the children did in the bottom 20th percentile on the Woodcock-Johnson word identification subtest. That's the operational definition. And then they'll have exclusionary clause like not, you know, no known brain damage, not blindness, deafness, you know, those kinds of things. IQ above 85 or some, some number 80. So that's it. That's the operational definition. Um, and we have hundreds and hundreds of studies using that basic operational definition. So the idea of distinguishing among different reasons why, well, I shouldn't say reasons, the, the, the five things I mentioned, the phonological core deficit, which is, uh, you know, phonemic analysis, phonemic blending, rapid naming, working memory, and poor letter sound skills, um, those are virtually universal. Um, we just don't have evidence of another reason why a child would be a poor word level reader, other than the obvious things like lack of opportunity or, you know, blindness, deafness, those types of things. But in terms of some sort of underlying cognitive processes um, of a child who otherwise seems normal, one big study in 1998 with over, with over 380 kids they pulled kids from lots of different districts and they looked at all those phonological variables and a whole bunch of other things. They wanted to look at subtypes based on, do they have ADHD as well? Do they have math disabilities also? Do they have uh, working memory problems or not working memory problems? Do they have rapid naming problems or not rapid naming? And they came up with about seven or eight subtypes based on those particular features, various combinations. Every single one of them had the phonological core deficit. They did, out of the 380 some kids, they did not find one who got a clean bill of health on the phonological skills. So if there is some kid that has some unique, strange thing, there it's less than one, you know, less than one quarter of 1% of kids with uh, poor word level reading. So researchers know a lot about it. My angle tends not to be on, um, you know, do they qualify or don't they qualify? Because one thing researchers will never provide us with, and they just can't based on the nature of the phenomenon, a cutoff. They can't provide a cutoff because it's it's so fine grained. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are you familiar with the the dyslexia screener? I think from Shaywitz at Yale. It's it goes it starts in kindergarten. Would you think that that would be a useful tool? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about it to make any comments. I'm a little. I I, I know there's a colleague in my department who knows a, a awful lot more about it, uh, and we've had discussions. So I'd only be giving you secondhand information. Um, but I, I'm a little wary about something that's not directly testing the skills. Um, and one of the things we know about, um, one of the, you know, we've known since the 70s, in some of Fletcher's early work and, and you know, letters, letter name knowledge, letter sound knowledge, and basic phonological awareness, being able to clap out syllables or whatever, in kindergarten has about an 80% accuracy rate for predicting who's going to struggle in reading two years later, okay? And so th that's data we should be getting on all kids. And, and the universal screeners, I think, do a pretty good job with that. One thing that should be added is, is there any family history of a biological parent, biological sibling, 
biological aunt or uncle uh, or grandparents. Forget about cousins because that you know the gene pool gets all <laughs> mixed up there. But so if if the if the answer is yes, then that you know gives us even uh, much more in terms of you have a child where there's absolutely no family history on either side and there's enough people to, to draw from. It's probably, you know, my, one of my grandsons, we had, you know, my, um, one of my grandsons, he was kind of a late starter in the reader. And I did not worry because I knew on both sides of the family, there were plenty of us on both sides and nobody had a reading problem. And you know what, once he decided he wanted to read, he just took off, you know? So, so adding that and down at Florida state, uh, they're one of the funding hubs for the NICHD. They've done a number of studies to show that adding that one element really ramps up our ability to find out who's really at risk. Okay. As far as the, the whole dyslexia thing, is there? do you think there's any chance of that definition being refined or more operationalized than just this broad thing? Are there, is there a particular thing? And I think the second part of that question was, um, you know, does it need intervention in a particular way? Does that make no. sense? Well, yes, in the sense that you look at those features. Now, the problem is we don't have uh, any any research to show about how we could correct working memory, how we could correct rapid naming. Um, but here's some interesting news. And this is not from st this. These weren't studies trying to find this. These were studies that just accidentally found it in studies where kids made upper single digit up until like literally 20 standard score point gains in their word reading and they improved their phonological awareness. So they made moderate to very strong uh, word reading improvement. Uh, we, we routinely seem to see five to 10 standard score point gains in working memory and in rapid naming. I will tell you a little secret about rapid naming that the school psych field needs to know. Um, I, the, some of the stuff I hear people say about rapid naming is like 15 years old, okay? So we thought we had a pretty good idea back in the 90s, early 90s, uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s of, the, of precisely how rapid naming was disrupting reading. The problem was science gets in the way and it disrupted some of those ideas. But those ideas are now filtering into the school side field. So when people give you very uh, confident ideas of how rapid naming is disrupting reading, um, let, let me put it this way. I was at the Society for Scientific Study of Reading Conference this summer, and I sat in a rapid naming breakout session. And I also sat in a similar session two years ago. And at the end, during the discussion part, they're all scratching their heads about exactly how does rapid naming disrupt reading. So the, the, the top people around the world that are studying it, we know a lot about rapid naming. We can give you all kinds of fun facts about rapid naming. But when it comes right down to precisely how is that disrupting the reading process, the people studying this don't know. Uh, so be a little wary of, of flippant explanations. And, and, and in fact, just knowing that it spontaneously improves along with reading improvement and phonological awareness improvement, it makes them scratch their heads even more. So the, the question is, is it really causal? Uh, anyway, because we can't directly train it, so we can't do an experiment to determine the causality of it. As far as supports, um, what are some evidence-based supports that you would recommend for word level reading or um, reading interventions that you've yeah. developed? got to start the tier one. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the reading panel was all about. Here's, here's something that's also kind of sad, but hopefully it, the nine scientific, the nine scientific nature of this is uh, misleading me, but I, I fear it's not. So in the last two years, I presented in like 24 different states and three Canadian provinces and many of those states multiple times. Um, and without hardly missing any classes, by the way, it's tough. Impressive. <laughs> a, lot of late, a lot of late night flights, okay? And late night car drives. Anyway, um, so well, all my classes are crammed into Tuesday, Thursdays. That's part of it. Uh, so anyway, um, I ask the same question wherever I go. I say, how many of you in your school buildings have some formal phonological awareness training in kindergarten or first grade? And in a room of 100 people, anywhere from one to six hands will go up. What that means is we are not doing tier one in the United States. I mean, I realize that's a non-scientific poll, but it, it, to me, it's gotta be telling me something, the fact that I get that same consistent, you know, that same result. That if you go back and look at the reading panel, that was the very first item of the big five. When they did, throughout the 90s, when they did uh, training in kindergarten or first, virtually every study was one or the other, 
when they did formalized training tier one with phonological awareness, that reduced the number of struggling readers by on average about 50% right out of the starting gates. Uh, so if we're not doing that, we're not doing tier one. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that we really need to do. We need to do phonological awareness training, whole class or small group, but all kids need to get it tier one in kindergarten and or first grade. I'd say both really. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's the first support. And the second support is we need to use, use approaches that focus on how we actually read. We read, we have an alphabet based writing system. We don't write words. They write words in Chinese, but we don't write words in English or Spanish. We write phoneme characters and then we string together phoneme characters and we call them written words. So if you have problems with the, you know, access to the phonemic structure of the spoken language, reading in an alphabet based writing system is very difficult for you. So um, all of our tier two efforts should be at developing the underlying skills uh, related to the phonemic proficiency and the letter sound proficiency. But yet most of our installed base of tier two is on getting kids to become better guessers, uh, using context to try to figure out words. Skilled readers do not use context to figure out words. Words jump out at them instantaneously. You give a skilled reader a list of words and they rattle them off instantaneously. The only words that we need context for are homo homographs like, you know, dove and dove, you know, present and present. And those are, you know, just a tiny, tiny slice of the words that we read. So, so the, the way that reading is being taught right now is, is it's doing exactly what um, comes natural to struggling readers in the first place. When they're reading, they don't know too many of the words and they're not good at sounding them out. What's left? Guessing from context. So what we do is we reinforce poor reader strategies in our instructional approach. This is balanced literacy, whole language, LLI, reading recovery, those various types of approaches do exactly that. So they, they, they provide children with no way to boots, you know, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps because they're not teaching them uh, how to read an alphabet-based writing system. And I see that a, a lot every time I'm in classrooms. It's kind of like, well, what, what do you think this could be based on the picture, based on what we talked about earlier, based on, you know, instead of like teaching the phonics or teaching, you know, those type of strategies. Um, you mentioned LLI. Any, um, any interventions to avoid? My district tends to use like those packaged kind of research-based interventions and we only have, you know, like three that we use. So it seems like everybody, like if you're in this grade, this is what you're getting. If you're in this grade, this is what you're getting, which is kind of sad. Um, anything to avoid or anything that you think is particularly helpful as far as interventions? Yeah, I, one of the things that has to happen, you have to realize researchers, there, there's no consumer reports data bank of research on this program, that program. If programs appear in the research literature, it primarily appears to illustrate a concept or an idea. So we need to think about research-based approaches, not necessarily programs per se. There are so few programs, and the few programs that have some data on them, it might be just one study or two studies. And, and you know, one study does not a finding make. And yet, when you look at the reading panel, they looked at these principles of phonological awareness and, and letter sound teaching across dozens and dozens and dozens of studies. And when they did that, when they did specific letter sound teaching, when they did phonological awareness, it always, always, always came out superior to when they didn't do those things. So that that's telling you approach, not a program. Guess what? There are many different programs that cut across those multiple studies. Uh, and there were some of them were experimenter design. So we don't, we, we simply do not have a database. It's not like consumer reports where we have that. Uh, if, if it is studied, it's because researchers say, hey, we want to, we want to study you know, specific systematic teaching of letter sounds versus uh, three cueing systems. They'll go out and just get a commercially available version of each of those and use them. They're not out to study those programs, they're out to study the, the concepts behind them. So the answer is for an educated uh, group of people that are gonna make decisions on working with kids. We need to know how reading works. And um, just like we, we, there's no battery of uh, tests that we have available to evaluate children for, for um, reading skills that are optimal. However, if we know how reading works, we can pull various uh, things off our shelf from different batteries and, and to deal with the issue of subtest unreliability, you do more than one of the exact same type of task from a different battery. Uh, granted, that's not perfect, it's not ideal, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to build a case to understand we have a hypothesis. Does this ch child have a problem with this? Look, I got two subtests from nationally normed tests and they both say it's low. Well, that gives me more confidence than 
if they're high, okay? So um, so use multiple subtests of the same type across different batteries and, and, and look at that. Um, sometimes that's way better than composites. I mean, Woodcock Johnson, it's a great test. I love it. I've used it for years. But what do they do? On one of their composites, they take their, their comprehension test, their, their word attack test, and their, and their word identification, put them all as one composite. You know what that tells you? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. If it's really low, it tells you the kid's a low reader. If it's really high, the kid's not a, such a bad reader. But if it's low, you don't know. You know so we, we, have to, we have to consider things of a similar sort. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but yeah, yeah. It, it makes me a little bit sad about my, my district. <laughs> but, well, they're like everyone else though. Right. You know? uh, and by the way, I, I, I want to put in a little, a little plug here for a group called the reading league. Maybe some of you have heard it before. Uh, it was just founded about two years ago, a little over two years ago by a, a professor of literacy and she wanted to get the stuff from the scientific journals out into the schools and they've been kind of taken off. They have a, it's thereadingleague.org is their website and they do all, it's all free, free, everything's free. Um, and, uh, you know, they have lots of videos to follow up on the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And interestingly, some of the founding members, including myself, I was a board member until I got demoted. Um, <laughs> well, what happened was, you know, you're an official, what is it? 503C or 50B or you know, whatever, 1099 miscellaneous, I don't know, whatever. When you're one of those, you, you have, you set a certain board or number of board members, and we had this person that we really wanted on the board, so I, I backed off. I'm just on the advisory panel. But anyway, I was one of the founding board members, and most of the founding board members were members of the Society for Scientific Study of Reading, you know, so we're trying to get the stuff to the, out to schools, and it's, it's been having quite a, quite a positive impact. So that's a, that's a possible follow-up. But my point is most schools uh, are, are in the same situation your school is in, but whole states are turning it around. Mississippi, Mississippi's had the fast, you know, one of the fastest growth of states because they decided they were at the bottom, number 50, okay? Wow. Well, now they're up to like 45. Now that may not be too impressive, but it's still showing they're on the move because they're applying the scientific uh, up types of approaches. Um, uh, Colorado has been doing some amazing stuff just in the last year or two. Uh, Arkansas right now is, is, you know, here's what's interesting. I've had the opportunity to work with people in state ed and some of the state eds. Everybody but my own state. What's up with that? But anyway, uh, and so um, they probably know something the others don't. Uh, anyway, so the um, uh, I meet all these people at state at, and I tell them, I says, you're changing my perspective on state bureaucrats. I mean, you guys really are out to try to do the best for kids. And it just, I know, is it awful I say that? It shocks me, you know? <laughs> Because you just think they're paper pushers and yeah, whatever. But man, I'll tell you, they, they get very excited about this stuff and very passionate. And it's, it's just so exciting. I'd say about five different states that maybe six now that I've worked with uh, that are fired up in some major school districts, some major school districts. I'm talking, well, let me just say one of them has 1,100 schools and one has 900 schools. And I'm not, you could probably figure that out from there. But um, so yeah, so we, we got we to gotta get on this and, and, and start applying the science. The science has been there a long time. And it's, it's so frustrating because I think that us as school psychs, we're not talked to when, you know, curriculum and policy changes and, and things like that. I mean, even in my um, district, school psychologists are separate from special ed. They're two different departments and special ed handles all the achievement testing. And so if we try and even get in there, we're kind of stepping on people's toes. And so it's it's kind of frustrating to have some knowledge and to be want to share it, but it's it's not our place. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, you know, at the, at the corner of my eye, because I can't read the, the, the things that pop up here because it's too small, but on the corner of my eye, I saw something. How was how a school psychologist going and tell a reading specialist how to, uh, how to do their job? <laughs> well, I'll tell you how we did it. The very first meeting we had of the reading league when we first formed the group, um, you know, I said, here's how, here's the worst way to do it. The worst way is, you know, I kind of picture face to face. Here's, look, I got this, you know, this is what you need to do. Instead, it's like, think of you side by side with the person saying, hey, look at this cool stuff I learned about. I want you to look at it. Tell me what you think. Because really what I'm trying to get at, sort of my, my spearhead, so to speak, of this, is I did a review, because I'm a school psychologist, I did a review of the research, the intervention literature, in a manner that had never been done before. What do we, we think in terms of standard score gains, right? Well, all of the research is, uses effect size. They may report standard score point gains in the, in the table, but often don't even discuss it. But what do we do? We, we give a child a test. We score up their 
their uh, their raw scores and we look and look in the tables. How do they do? How do they do? Right. So that's the mentality. Well, I started noticing some discrepancies between the, the standard scores and effect size. Why? Because effect size compares to a control group and control groups don't represent a stable phenomenon across studies. Some control groups go up, some go down, some stay the same. So I decided to take a fresh look at the research literature and come to find out um, the uh, using standard scores, there's a big separation in outcomes based upon the nature of the instruction. And so the kind of instruction that is involved with the, what the research has been saying and what the orthographic learning research has been saying, like how we remember words, gets between 10 and 25 standard score point gains, usually a whole standard deviation. Check back a year or two later, it's maintained. Most of the things we're currently doing gets between zero and five standard score point gains. Check back a year later, and often that's even lost. So, and then there's kind of a middle group, but the middle group has been, you know, six or seven or eight standard score point gains, but almost everything in that group is not commercially available. They were like experiment or design tests. So basically I'm saying we got zero to five standard score point gains. We've got, we've got, you know, 16, 14, 15, 16, 17. Which do you want? That's my spearhead. Which do you want? We have, we have either. And, and the instructional differences uh, will determine that. So that one, that would be a way to approach a reading specialist. If you have that kind of data available, you go, hey, look at this. What do you think? Okay. Very cool. I have one more question. I'm being so greedy. I'm sorry. Um, and because I know we have some viewer questions, so I promise we're going to get to you guys. <laughs> I'm just impulsive. Um, so I'm guessing that if you were looking at kind of these reading programs that are more global in respect to their, you know, comprehension and vocabulary, phonemic awareness and phonics, and they're like, kind of loosely addressing each of those areas versus one that's specific and targeted to, you know, phonics that we know that this particular student um, is struggling with. I'm guessing that the more specific is, is the way you want to go, correct? It, it's hard to say. The, the reality is I know so little about the commercially available programs, like the large basal reading series and things like that. You know, what I've spent my time on is is in the reading research literature. And even if they have such a program and they describe it, you get two paragraphs. So it's very difficult for me to comment on that. But I, I will say this, that everybody feels compelled to check the boxes and say, oh yeah, we do all the big five. We do all the big five, of course we do. Because they know they won't sell their program if they don't. So even if they just you know, not give it a nod, um, they'll say, yeah, we have it. Just so you know, research-based, it's not a protected term. And so as a result, um, Research based attached to a program means please buy our program. That's all it means. I, I kid you not. That's what it means. It, it means no, no, nothing more than that. I know it wasn't intended to mean that, but that's what's come to mean. We have um, some viewer comments that maybe I'll just throw in quickly. And I, I know we're heck getting to the end of uh, our time, but. Um, a viewer commented that she once had a speech language pathologist tell her that if a student has not mastered phonemic awareness skills prior to third grade, then they will they never will, and that we shouldn't continue to provide intervention for phonemic awareness. That's a person who hasn't spent enough time in the research literature. Actually, I don't mean to be patronizing, but no, we have. Let me tell you a very encouraging study: uh, two hundred eighty-one phonological core deficit individuals. Uh, you know, dyslexia, severe reading disorder. Uh, 281 coming through a clinic in Canada, in Calgary, Canada, that has amazing reputation. Um, and it reported in Annals of Dyslexia back in 94. Out of the 281, uh, only one did not make progress in phonological awareness. One. So when we move forward and say this kid can learn this, we're going to be wrong less than one half of 1% of the time. And I'm talking about not the general population, I'm talking about individuals with dyslexia. More importantly, 75% of them um, got 100% on the Linda Mood auditory conceptualization task, which is a very different phonemic task. Roughly speaking, it means that 75% of those individuals ended up with perfectly normal phonological awareness. Now, here's how this addresses the, the person's question. Um, the age range was 5 to 55. They had two dozen individuals from 18 to 55, and they made the most reading progress compared to any others, and they all mastered the phonemic awareness. If you think, phonema, well, what am I trying to say? So the interesting thing, we, we hear about catch them early, and that's important, it really is. However, a number of studies have broken down the age ranges and the, when they got those big results. These are the ones that get the standard deviation results. And the older the student typically 
the more progress they make, the faster the progress they make in, in phonemic awareness and in word reading. So there is absolutely no statute of limitations uh, on that. And that that is some something I've heard other places. It's simply misinformation. And there's totally no way that in the, you know, in those older grades, at least from what I'm seeing, that people even consider that that could be a problem and that that needs intervention because once you get out of those kind of primary grades, it just goes by. Yeah, if we, knew, if we knew what to do with the older kids, we'd be doing it. So I think it's more of a reflection that we don't know that those kind of gains can be made and how to do that. I do know of one particular pretty large school district that has an amazing thing where they're taking kids with IEPs in middle school. They're pulling them out for one half of a school year and going to another, it's all public school, another public school and they're getting this intensive work on reading and math and uh, they're averaging 11 standard score points gains with these kids and then they send them back and now they're way more functional in terms of their reading so there you go there's an example of a of you know a successful program doing that and by the way that 11 is so important because most of our standard point gains and most of the things we're currently doing uh, hovers around three All right, we're looking for last minute questions. Um, I think um, Crystal wants to know, can you tell me uh, where the research re you're referring to on uh, PA skills comes from? I argue this point with my SLP and reading code frequently and want the research to show them. Have any citations? <laughs> Hundreds, um, yeah, I mean, th that's the hard part. Uh, there is no one study that shows how um, an atom works. It's many, many hundreds of studies overlaid on top of each other. But in the same way, there are there are plenty of studies that show this. I'm trying to think of the best way. I, I'd be happy to. I mean, the, the, the tier uh, one, two, and three were based on specific work. Tier two and tier three did intensive phoneme awareness training. One of the sad parts about the whole RTI enterprise, which I think is a great service delivery system, but the problem is that it was prompted by NICHD grants because of the, re the research results were so strong. They said, we got to ramp this up for the whole country. And so we, when we launched it, we spent all our time on the structure of RTI and the, the process of moving through it and the different groupings and, and the, the, uh, you know, uh, the universal screenings and the uh, progress monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing that never got translated was what did they actually do in those studies to produce such great results? What did they do instructionally? That wasn't communicated adequately. Turns out um, they did intensive phonemic awareness in those studies and they did intensive training of letter sound skills. So that's, there you go. The studies, Torgerson and colleagues, Journal of Learning Disabilities 2001, prompted tier three. Bellatino and colleagues, 1996, Journal of Educational Psychology, uh, prompted tier two. They're both big NICHD studies. Great. And a very last question, viewer question. What is the best source to find interventions that have strong effect sizes? Um, you want to go to the um, Institute for Educational Sciences. I hate to say this, but I lost my faith in the What Works Clearinghouse because they use effect sizes and the way they do their work. Um, they, there are some programs that are actually pretty crummy that look good, and there are some programs that are actually pretty good that look crummy. Um, and they have so few studies are going on. The problem is they separate from this research-based approach versus research-based programs. They're trying to be, they're trying to be um, uh, consumer reports, and as is bestevidence.org at Johns Hopkins, they have the same basic problem with it. Instead, we have some really good um, things coming out of the IES, the Institute for Educational Sciences, U.S. Department of Education. They're called practice guides. And we have several practice guides, and what they do is exactly what I'm saying. They, they look for research-based approaches. So if you want to go look at the – if you type in IES practice guides, you'll get several um, several documents. And, and, and they have other things, too, like on behavioral stuff and math. It's not just reading. Florida Center for Reading Research has a lot of great stuff, the Reading League. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to post that to our social media pages as well. I'm – Googling away as you speak. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come. I mean, you're so knowledgeable. I'm just like, I'm jotting notes down and <laughs> things that I'm going to look into. Uh, so thank you for sharing your time. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm, 
I'm, I, I see some of the other people you had, and I'm like, really? I'm following Cecil Reynolds? How am I going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> We've been very lucky, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I want to remind everybody, um, it looks like 11.4 is the next time we're back and we're talking about DBT. So um, looking forward to it. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Oh, last minute question. Sue wants to know, when is the new book coming out? People are very uh, It can't book. come out until I send it to the editors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I, we're just doing last minute uh, editing. You know, we're talking, we're not talking content. We're just talking about typos and things like that. It, it should have been, it's actually a whole year overdue and it should have been out. Um, you know, I was going to send it in about a week ago, but, um, but we'll see. It's going to, uh, Springer, Springer is the publisher. Okay. Great. Very cool. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. Good night, everybody. Bye everybody.